Welcome to the 700th episode of the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be hosting a distinguished guest who has embodied dedication to municipal governance and community service. Gordon Krantz is the longstanding mayor of Milton, Ontario, and he joins us today to share insights gleaned from his remarkable tenure in local politics. Having first entered the political arena as a town councillor in the 1965 election, Mayor Krantz's journey has been defined by unwavering commitment and visionary leadership. With an impressive 21 terms under his belt, including 14 terms as mayor, his 10 years surpasses records and stands as a testament to the enduring impact on Ontario's municipal landscape. Throughout his tenure, Mayor Krantz has spearheaded transformative projects from infrastructure development to cultural initiatives shaping Milton's growth and prosperity. His contributions extend beyond the town's borders, influencing regional policies and fostering collaboration across Greater Toronto. So stay tuned as we will be back with the 700th episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Mayor Gord Krantz. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Gordon, Gord, I want to thank you so much for doing this, for sitting down and talking about municipal governance, but also about yourself. As the 700th episode of the show, I wanted to bring on someone who has been on the front lines of municipal politics for some time. And well, everyone pointed towards you and you were the one to talk to. So I've got to start by asking you, you have had a lengthy career in municipal politics and municipal governance. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Gord? Well, I told the story, Chris, on several occasions. Uh, They quite often will accuse uh, ladies uh, in beauty salons of doing this, and that's chitter-chatter. Well, listen, as far as I'm concerned, some of us guys are just as bad, if probably not worse, for that idle chat. In uh, 1965, now that's a long time ago, uh, Chris, in 1965, that's where it all started. I was in the barbershop. And of course, keeping in mind at that time, elections were every year, every year. So I was in there complaining about what the politicians at the town of Milton were doing or not doing at that time, as people are still doing it right to this very day. So someone had enough nerve to say, well, you know, if you think you can do any better, why don't you run? That resonated with me. It really did. And I was in business. I've been in business at that time in the heating oil business, gasoline, stuff like that for about five years. So I I knew I was reasonably well-known, had a pretty good reputation business-wise. So uh, no, the format for elections then were a little different than what they certainly were today. All you had to do was be 21 years of age at that time, either own or rent in the municipality that you live in for at least six months. And I qualify for all of those. So... uh, the only thing to qualify you for to run, you had to show up at a uh, at a uh, you know nomination meeting, as they call it, and it was run by the clerk of the municipality, and it started at seven seven in the evening and went to nine. So I never mentioned any of the, you know this to my uh, wife, and I had a young family, two young children at the time as well. And uh, come around supper time, I said to my wife, I said I'm going to go up to that nomination meeting tonight, uh, you know where they you know nominate people to run for the upcoming election. She said, why are you interested? And I honestly, Chris, I was not. I was not interested. I was just more 
curious than anything else, still tucked away in the back of my mind what that fellow had said in the barbershop. So up I go. And again, as I mentioned, I know I was reasonably well uh, known. And, and of course, I'd never shown any intention to getting involved in public life whatsoever. So I showed up there and quite a few people there. And are you interested in running for politics, uh, for council? I said, no, not really. Uh, I'm just here to observe. So about halfway through the meeting, the process was uh, somebody had to jump up and nominate you. Somebody had to jump up and second you. And I didn't ask anyone to do that for me. Someone just out of the crowd just jumped up and said, I'll nominate Gord Krantz. So my name automatically goes on the board. Somebody jumps up and says, I'll second. So it's there. So the meeting uh, closes at nine o'clock and the clerk reads out, this is going to be the format. And of course they do it for the mayor. And at that time there were Reeves, deputy Reeves, there was no regional government. And uh, they'll go from the bottom up and then from the top down. Now keep in mind, I was in about the middle of the pack. There was 11 people on that board to run for council for six seats. So I'd never been called chicken in my life. So now what do I do? You had the chance of say, let my name stand or uh, decline. So they start from the top down. Everybody said, I'll stand, come down to me. And of course, you know, I say I stand. But also the 11 of us, we all stood. Now there was one proviso uh, then, and to some degree it's still the same today. You have until five o'clock the next day to have what they refer to as sober second thoughts. So I, uh, I come home and tell my wife well, what happened. She says, uh, what are you going to do? I says, well, I, I'm thinking about running. What do you think? She says, you're going to do what you're going to do anyway. <laughs> and she was probably absolutely right. So that, as I say, the rest is history. So I think in the, I think the third or fourth spot out of 11 of us. So that means six were elected and the other five weren't elected. So I finished in third or fourth spot on that election. Of course, that was the start of 1965. So I, I've got to ask the million dollar follow-up question. For someone who wasn't engaged in municipal politics prior to 65, yeah. you had a curiosity of it going into that. How does a guy like that become the longest serving mayor and, uh, and municipal leader in this great country of Canada? Because was it that good? Was it just a good run and you just have enjoyed it ever since and you just find it challenging and every year it brings a new challenge to you? Because yeah. I know a lot of people, especially people younger than me, who get tired of doing something after a year. I can't imagine doing something for 59 years. Well, Chris, you're absolutely right. You've got to enjoy what you do. And of course, in this business here, if you're not criticized every once in a while, you're really not doing your job. And I will tell anybody that's interested in that. If you get criticized from time to time, then you know you're doing your job and doing it uh, well. I've known some real, real great people that have got involved in politics with me. And even at the provincial and federal levels that become totally disillusioned uh, uh, because of because of the criticism and not being able to achieve what you uh, would like to see achieved, but you just have to roll with the punches, and you can't get or shouldn't get discouraged on losing the odd battle. I often said I've lost many battles, but for the most part, won the war, and that's really you know the way that I've looked at it uh, over the years. Because that, as an example, uh, in our most recent uh, Milton budget where we, uh, or the majority council approved a nine and a half, or almost, I think, 9.8% tax increase. I didn't support it, but I was on the losing end of it. I'm a firm believer in democracy that majority rules. Uh, you know, the strong mayor's powers, uh, the province give us that authority. And I said, you know, I don't want to have any part of it unless the wheels were absolutely falling off of it. Democracy is very fragile as it is, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I never want to be perceived as a uh, dictator, yeah, especially a benevolent dictator might be in some people's uh, vocabulary, but not mine for sure. So that's where I come from on there. And the cliche that I've often used, and I'm reasonably good at one-liners, uh, I'm here, uh, I'm elected to, to serve an attempt to satisfy the majority of the people, the majority of the time. Not all the people all the time, because once you attempt that, Chris, you're gonna fail. And I have no intention of failing.
How do you do that? Because I, I, I can imagine, as you've said so candidly so far in the interview, you know that you're not going to please 100% of the people. Exactly. How, do you, how do you know that you're getting it right? Is it just elections? Is it just putting your name on the ballot again? Or is there a metric that you put on yourself that if something is doesn't pass the smell test, I'm not going to vote for it? Because there are people who are potentially putting their names on the ballot who are going, if I want a good career in municipal politics like Gord has, what metrics do I need to put into place to ensure that I know I'm doing the good for the community? Well, it's an interesting question. And uh, one of the things that I think that people very quickly uh, become aware of, your sincerity uh, of being sincere. And you have to demonstrate that right up front. I'm pretty good at doing my homework. People will want to uh, come in and chat with me and whatever it might be, some early affair, whatever it might be. And I'm usually pretty good at doing my homework. And uh, and I know I'm going to be approached sometimes on, on a question of that I know that would almost be impossible uh, to achieve. And I never promise anybody anything that I, I know that I absolutely can't achieve. So when a person comes into my office uh, with, a, with a concern or a reason, and, and I know maybe it's a 50-50 chance, I might know it's 90% in favor of them or 10% uh, against them and vice versa. And I'll tell that person, I said, you know, you're here and thanks very much for coming. Now, you've got one of two choices. And they'll say, what's my one of two choices? And I use it all the time, Chris. I'll say, I'll tell you what you want to hear, or I can tell you the truth as I see it. And that's a qualifier in it, as I see it. Am I always right? Probably not. But as I see it at the moment, and they said, please tell me the way that you see it. And I do. And I say, I've been very successful on that uh, approach. So you're truthful, sincere, right out front with them. There's no false hope for that individual when they leave uh, this office, even though personally, sometimes I might like to see what they're attempting to do, but I know in the system it wouldn't work. I have noticed over the last few years, and I've been following municipal politics since I was a kid back in Clarington, Ontario, um, since about 2000. And I can tell you that the apathy that I see when it comes to municipal politics is astounding. More and more people are not showing up to City Hall to watch a council meeting. More and more people aren't getting involved and putting their names on the ballots like they were back in the early 1990s when you had about 10 or 15 people putting their names on the ballot. In your time in office, have you seen that apathy around municipal government grow? And what do you see as a sort of a silver bullet to ensure that people are still engaged locally to ensure that municipal governments stay relevant in 2024 and 2025? Yeah, well, the interesting part of it is, uh, you know, back in the day when I was first elected, I think the biggest majority of the people wanted to get elected uh, to, you know, in my case, attempt to move the community forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chris, I was elected probably on a, a, what I refer to as a pro-growth agenda, keeping in mind when I was elected, Tom Mountain was 4,800 people. Today we're what, roughly 150,000, give or take. Uh, but you know what I find now, the odd individual, and I shouldn't say the odd one, and I wouldn't go so far to say the majority, but there's a lot of people that run just on a single issue, whatever that single issue might be. They want to run on, and I'll just use this just to illustrate. Someone is very intent to say, the only reason I'm running, I want to build a new library, or I want to build a new fire hall, or I want to build a new rec center, whatever it is, and that's all they're focused on. And I said, please, if you're thinking about it, if you're ever elected, look at the big picture. All of those things that I just mentioned are so important to the community. Recreation, good roads, good water, good sewer, good police and good fire, good, you know, the whole bit. Just don't single one thing out and focus on that. And some people have trouble doing that because they're focused on what they think is really, really critical. But all those things are critical to society. And you never want to forget about that. Uh, you know, uh, you might think of someone of uh, my age, my era. You wouldn't really think about uh, too much. Who cares about child care? Well, I got no you know, children that needs child care. I got no children that's going to school. But I try to think at least 5, 10, 20, 50 years in the future all the time. 
I've got grandchildren. I've got great grandchildren. Am I concerned about their future and everybody else's future? Most definitely. If you don't know where you've been, there's a good chance you'll not know where you're at. You sure as heck no, will not know where you're heading. So trying to look uh, ahead is uh, a big thing in this business here. And like as a projection, we're planning in Melton and Halton right now for the next 30 years. Don't ask me why, but they, 2051 is the magical target. We're planning for 2051, believe it or not. And the problem sets that, and I have no problems with that, trying to think ahead to 2051. You already heard me say that Melton's population today, give or take, is 150,000. I know by 2051, we'll, we'll probably exceed a quarter of a million people. So you have to plan for that, where you, where you live, work, and play. And that's the secret to success, and being committed to that. Is it hard to balance the future with the here and now? Because most people in your position as mayors and councillors are, are, agree are probably looking at that 2051 target that the province has set down or 10 years down the line. But you can't forget about the here and now because the people here and now are looking for services, are looking for growth, are looking for opportunities, are looking for a good place to live, work and play. How do you balance those aspects of future versus the here and now? Yeah, well, it's interesting, and again, uh, which most people can uh, relate to. <clears throat> As an example, I'm not a climate, uh, you know, change denier. I think the climate is changing. You heard me say before, the business that I was in for over 20 years was fuel oil, uh, you know, carbon. Uh, they're trying to get rid of that now. I think slowly but surely that will happen, but it's got to be phased in. Uh, as an example, you hear about the tax on on carbon now. Now that'll drive up, you know. And I still drive a a car. This is a gas car. It's not electric yet, but I'm you know sincerely thinking about you know the next car may be a hybrid or, or electric. And I know that's the way of the future, but they got to be phased in. Like as an example, uh, you know, I think probably at least what sixty or seventy percent of us still drive a gas automobile. And as an example, uh, you know, if you were to put it up and I just use these numbers just to illustrate 10 or 15 or 20 cents per liter, that really gets expensive for the average individual, you know, if he, if he or she traveling. But on the flip side of that, you know, your oranges, uh, your pineapples not come from Hawaii or Florida, places like transportation. So all of a sudden, every liter of diesel fuel, and I know they're you know, slowly but surely converting trucks into electric now. Uh, but guess what happens if you and I want to go to the grocery store and buy that pineapple or that, uh, you know, uh, orange? The price is way up there. And believe it or not, Chris, this is the big concern of the majority of people right now because you and I know what's happened to groceries, as an example, over the past two or three years. The, the price just to exist. Uh, on buying your groceries, if you've got a family of four, I mean, that, you know, it's got a tremendous impact on the average family. So it's a trickle down effect. You're going to be paying more for your oranges from Florida because they got to pay a lot more for the fuel to go to Florida and bring them back uh, here. So, you know, it's cyclical. So you really got to be careful of uh, implementing stuff that, in, in my opinion, needs to be done. But boy, you've got to kind of just ease it in to start with. And that's what I find is acceptable for the most people. Can, can I sort of, I want to pick up on that for a second. And I, I love this conversation already because I feel like we're just two old friends having a conversation, but you have seen inflation over your time in office. This is not the first time. This won't be the last time that inflation takes place. We saw it in the nineties. We saw it in the eighties. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, we saw it in the early two thousands. Do municipalities have a like silver bullet that they can use during this inflationary period, or is it just as it is, and we just have to accept it and ride the inflation roller coaster that we're currently on? Well, Chris, I don't accept it uh, personally uh, because I don't want to contribute to inflation. And you know, this municipality that I partially help represent, I think by that nine and uh, almost 10% tax increases for 2024, contributed to inflation. Now, it's very, very difficult for a politician to say no to somebody that wants whatever it is. And, and 
you know, sometimes it's needed. But it's, I, and I uh, refer to it, if you've got a family of two or three or four at Christmas time, you're on a limited budget. So little Chris and little Gordy and little Mary and everybody else, it's, you know, your parents say, make out your list for Santa Claus. Santa Claus, you know, is coming. So you make out your list for Santa Claus and then, you know, Santa Claus looks at that list and says, gosh, you know, I can't give you everything you want. It might only be one thing. Us politicians are faced with the same thing. I'm saying, well, you know, we might be able to give you just one thing instead of two or three things. So, and that is a tough thing to do. Acting as Santa Claus, just think, uh, you know, if you're a Santa Claus or a parent saying, Santa Claus can't give you what you want. Uh, and you know what? A lot of truth in that. So very difficult for politicians to say you're not going to get everything you want. Does it get easier to say no to people though? Because I can imagine over the your time you've you've had to say no to people who just come to you with unrealistic things or even things that are potentially not in the municipal jurisdiction. Healthcare, they want a new school, but you know you can't do that because that's not the responsibility of the municipality. Does it get easier to say no to people after you do have that conversation, that sincere conversation saying, unfortunately, unless you want your taxes to continue yeah. to go up by 10%, it's not yeah. going to happen. Yeah, exactly. You know, and the odd person will say, I don't mind you putting your taxes up, but that odd person is reasonably well off too. So it doesn't hurt, but there's a lot of people up there, Chris, that's just living paycheck to paycheck. And I mean, a lot of them and some reasonably well people, uh, you know, uh, got maybe three or $400,000 mortgage or half a million dollar mortgage, especially if you're a young family. So boy, they're struggling, even if mom and dad are both uh, working with a reasonably good job. They don't have a lot of excess to cash, I can assure you of that. Uh, they're, and if one of them happens to get sick or hurt or something, uh, they could be behind the eight ball because we'll see it here and back uh, taxes from time to time. And I you know, personally don't have to get involved in it, but every once in a while, if you see back taxes starting to pile up, you say, well, there's got to be a reason for it. So guess what? Those are some of the reasons, uh, Chris, for it uh, there too. So it's not hard to tell who's hurting a little bit. Before we turn to the the Milton as a whole, I, I have one final question. I kind of already know what the answer is going to be because uh, we've already talked about it a bit, but I want to play in the sandbox for a little bit. And I want to know, What's been the biggest change in municipal governance from your perspective in your t tenure in office? Well, probably, uh, Chris, as far as I'm concerned, uh, bureaucracy has grown larger and the uh, bureaucratic process on getting things done just, you know, boggles my uh, mind. When I was first elected as a council and even the early years as mayor, uh, you had to do your own homework. You make the decisions. Uh, like as an example, uh, environmental assessments. Uh, I refer to if you're going to build a new road or new bridge or something, I used to use the uh, the expression "get her done, do it, <laughs> get her done." But now, listen, you've got to go through so many darn hoops that it's not even funny, and there's a cost to that as well. Not only delays and uh, it's the bureaucratic red tape that you have to go through you know, two or three dozen different, uh, you know, uh, ministries. And in our case, you know, there's, you know, the roads department, there's the parks department, and everybody's got to have a say at it. you got your boards of education, and everybody's got to have their input into it, conservation authorities. And in our case here, uh, we got a large portion of the Niagara Escarpment that runs through our community. So those are all those levels of government that quite often, you know, slow things down and getting things done instead of, as I refer to it back in the day, just get her done. Have you got it done? Can I can I uh, ask you that question? Looking I, back on your tenure and yeah, still looking towards uh, you here, did you get yeah, it done? I would I would say we got her done the most of it. Do you do you look? I, I never like playing in the past because you never always you, you always second guess what you could have done better looking back on things. But are there things that you wish you would have been able to move faster on or move a little bit? quicker on to set Milton up to be a bigger, brighter future of, of today? Or is the Milton of today what you envisioned when you first got elected in 1965? Uh, it's a work in progress, uh, Chris. Slow but sure. <laughs> Government never moves too awful quick. 
as an example, uh, just think about this. I've been working and playing around or fooling around, however you want to might capture it, with a university and a college in Milton, because I've always been of the opinion, a, uh, a very progressive municipality, a well-educated municipality is a very uh, lucrative municipality. And we set out and uh, driven by myself and uh, the late Mario Belvedere, who was one of my CEOs at the time, we chat about worldly affairs, and uh, now I'm going back probably almost 20 years ago now. It wouldn't be kind of nice that Milton had a, and we knew we were going to grow. We knew that. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had a college and a university on the same campus? And that was kind of pie in the sky thinking, because how many places, to my knowledge, in Canada or, or North America had a campus of a college and a university on the same site? We, we strove for that. Chris has taken me 15 uh, years to get it there, but you know what? It's happening as you and I speak right now. Conestoga College has a presence right here now. Uh, Laurier University has a presence, albeit a small presence in both cases now, but I can only assure it's only going to grow and grow and grow for the next 20, 30 uh, years. So well-educated community is a very prosperous uh, community. So that's what I uh, strive for live, work, and play. I want to talk about the town as a whole now. And I, before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it as I, I, as I always do. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the mayor's opinion. I get emails. I do not know why. Even after that ramble, here we are in 2024. Mayor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue that the town of Milton is facing heading into 2024? Well, of course, we touched on the inflation thing. It, it affects everything uh, there. Uh, just people that are here, people found a little, as cliche as it might sound, people have already found a little piece of paradise. Okay. Oddly enough, and I've experienced this, Chris, over the past you know 40 years that I've been there. I'm here now, shut the gates behind me, don't let anybody else in, you know, because I have found paradise. I don't want anybody else to find paradise. So there's that anti-growth out there, and I can assure anybody that wants to listen to me, it's going to happen whether I want it to or not. It's just the way of the world. So that's a challenge that we're, uh, we're faced with. And, and keeping up with the uh, with growth is a challenge. As an example, out of our jurisdiction, you and I touched on it earlier on. Boards of education, we've been reasonably good, uh, uh, lucky maybe, uh, on having schools keeping up for the most part with the, the growth of the community. But healthcare, hospitals, uh, they're, they're, they're full now. They're, uh, you know, in, in Milton's case, they had an expansion here, what, four or five years ago. But, you know, in my opinion, they probably need another one uh, now because they're pretty well at capacity now. So is those types of services keeping up with the growth of the community? In my opinion, not the way that they uh, they should. So how do you grow then? How do you grow in a world where things are not keeping up with the pace of growth in some sense? Because the analogy, if you build it, they will come is great, but in it's reverse for municipalities. If, if they come, you need to build it. And it seems like people of Milton are, people are coming to Milton and you need to keep up with those hospitals, those uh, uh, schools, even housing. Are people wanting to build in Milton still, or is there sort of a slowdown period right now going on in the community? Because I, I visited your community over the summer last year, and I saw the growth literally as I was driving into Milton. I couldn't believe how much it had changed since the last time I'd been there. Are people still trying to grow your community, but you have to sort of slow it down until you have those services that people can use? Well, the unfortunate part of it is, or fortunate, uh, we're growing uh, faster than uh, the province, and even we sometimes can uh, provide that. And again, uh, you know, uh, you know, the up, the upfronting of it, uh, there, the uh, capital cost, say for water and sewer, as an example, uh, uh, the present property taxpayer should not be paying for growth. 
And it's hard to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there's not some of that happening. And I know that as an example, if we build a new arena and I've been here forever, uh, I get to use that uh, arena too, or whatever it is. So shouldn't I pay maybe a little wee bit towards that? In my opinion, yes. But the biggest majority of it is paid for by new growth. And the odd part of it is though that new growth People are clamoring, people are lining up, Chris, to buy those new homes, whether it be a condominium, whether it be single, whether it be a semi. And, and rental is a bit of a, an issue too, because the private sector will not build rental if they can't turn a uh, profit on. And I understand you know, that very clearly uh, myself. So it's a balancing act uh, there all the time. But as an example, uh, the province, uh, they dictated municipalities, especially larger municipalities. We were giving a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a figure of growth, and they were reasonable with it. And and I stand corrected on this, but I think Milton's for the next ten years with twenty one thousand building uh, units, uh, we'll probably exceed that. And I know year by year there's numbers out there, and I know we'll exceed that too. So. Uh, I guess, Chris, to sum it up again, being a little cheeky too, everybody is still looking for a little piece of paradise here in Milton because one of the factors is the lifestyle. Uh, for sure, it's great here. And also, unbeknown to a lot of people, Milton still has not the lowest, one of the lowest property tax bases in the greater Toronto, even maybe the Golden Horseshoe area. So that's very attractive too for for businesses and uh, residential. So, uh, and is that part of good management over the years on my part and the councils of the past part? I think that's part of the reason for us uh, still attracting uh, uh, good businesses, still attracting uh, people. And they line up overnight to buy a house or you know, buy a condo here in Milton. And that's not unusual. We talked about the jurisdictional purview a few minutes ago in the interview, and I want to just ask this sort of political hot topic question, and you can pass if you want, but I just got to ask it. I've never avoided anything <laughs> in my life to Chris. Um, are you seeing uh, downloading from the province, whether it be the Ford government, the Wynn government, the McGinty government, the Eves government, the Harris government, so on and so forth, taking a toll on the finances of municipalities in today's uh, uh, sort of climate? Yes, uh, the answer to that, Chris, is yes, there is uh, downloading. And again, I go back into the Harris government days. That was tremendous downloading on municipalities. And I mean, big time downloading, downloading roads and stuff like that, even though they assumed some of the educational stuff. But municipalities, uh, they, uh, you know, I refer to it, the big fish eat the little fish. <laughs> uh, that's what the... Uh, and the stuff starts, and you'll hear the provincial people say it starts at the top, in the top of the federal government. They download it to the provincial governments, and provincial governments download it to the local municipalities. In our case here, we're in regional government. They sometimes download such as, you know, policing and, and health care uh, down to the regions. And then, of course, the regions say, well, you know, local municipalities can pick up some of that burden. So... We're the last in the food chain, so the buck stops right here at the local level. There's no place else other than cutting services or putting taxes up dramatically. And I don't mind a little bit of both. I, I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time and I know you're a busy mayor and I want to talk about my favorite subject and that's tourism. Now, yeah. you, we've talked about Milton growing at an exponential rate and it has grown significantly since when you first got elected to now. But there's always hidden gems in your community. There's always yeah. something that you say, you know what, if you come to Milton, come see this. What's that for you? What are the hidden gems of Milton that you would recommend to any tourist coming to your community? Well, you know, uh, oddly enough, and, and I've touched already, uh, Chris, on uh, Melton's urban area. Roughly, there's a population of 150,000, but what a lot of people probably aren't aren't aware of, the biggest majority, and Melton is roughly 137 square miles in geographic. That's a large community. And the large part of that is rural. And a large part of that is uh, protected by the Niagara Escarpment, which is a world biosphere. 
in, in that world biosphere, we have uh, many, many conservation authorities that are, and Milton has a lot of them, I think there's 10, 11,000 acres of conservation lands in Milton, like Glen Eden Ski Area, you know, Kelso, Crawford Lake, we have one of the most authentic uh, indigenous uh, villages uh, in, in the country, maybe even North America that's uh, been uh, authenticated. We have Crawford Lake, which is a Merrimictic Lake, which is a, a diamond in the rough. But they can go back four or 500 years and tell, you know, that the indigenous people are living there by the corn pollen that's at the bottom, bottom of that lake. They do what they call a frigid finger test and go down and sample the, the muck, bring it up and say, well, this, this decade, this century, there was this, this, and this. So those are just some of the things. And again, uh, Milton uh, was part of the Pan American Games. We built the only velodrome in the country now. I think there's one or two others now that's being built or has been built. And that's where the uh, college, we call it the Milton Education Village. And when it's all said and done, there'll be probably 30,000 people come and going with Laurier, Conestoga College, Schlegel Village, a, a, a small uh, business uh, park. There'll be residents there for those colleges and universities. So that's what attracts people to Milton. So tourism, the rural tourism is very much alive and well here. Now, keeping in mind that we're in Milton, we're only uh, an hour and 15 minutes away from the New York border uh, going into the U.S. So does that attract people? Definitely. Uh, three hours to go to the Michigan border for the Detroit, Sarnia area there. So we're very central. And again, internationally, we're 25 minutes away from Pearson International Airport, the biggest airport there is in the country. So there's something that I'd leave everybody out there. Uh, location, location, location is really what it's all about. And that little piece of paradise is right here in Milton and Holland. So where do you go after long days of meetings, after a long meeting in Toronto? Is there a place in Milton that you can go and decompress? Because I can imagine you have probably decompressed in a lot of places in Milton over your time. But is uh, there that one serene place that you can just go and just let it all go? Well, Chris, to be very honest with you, I'm a family man. I have a son, <laughs> daughter. I have six young adult grandchildren. I have seven great grandchildren. So for me de uh, to decompress is with family. Uh, I refer to myself as a homer, I guess. Uh, you know, and I do get out a lot socially. Uh, I've been a Legion member and I'm a big supporter of veterans and veterans affairs for many, many years. So will I go into the Legion and, you know, sit down and have a beer with the people? That's where you really find out what's going on with uh, people and just, socializing with them on the odd occasion. We've got some fine restaurants in, in Milton here, and I get in there every once in a while, socialize. And business is done there quite often as well, you know, going out for lunches and stuff like that. So even though it's business, a lot of it, but that's the way you socialize and, as you refer to it, hopefully decompress a little bit. A little, yeah. little bit of work and a little bit of pleasure goes a long way. Now, I, I was going to wrap up with my last question, but I, I, I have two minutes and I want to ask two questions of you, if, if you don't mind. We've talked about the advice that you would give any prospective candidates earlier on in the interview, but I, I've got to ask, what goes into making a good counselor? What goes into making a good mayor? You, you talk about sincerity, but there must be something else that goes into making a good politician at the municipal level in 2024 that you have been able to wrap up in a jar and use to make your career in politics so longstanding. I think Chris just answered that. If you can look an individual straight in the eye, and I think that's the secret to it, and sharing with him or her your perspective on what you uh, see there is really, really important, I think, uh, for sure. And the second question I had then is, 
how do we get more youth involved? Because you were elected when you were 30, and that was very rare back in the 60s. I don't care where you are. That was very rare for a 30-year-old man to get elected with a brand new family. To be honest, 27. So. Uh, 20, even, even 27 is when you were elected. Yeah, that's rare, yeah. So what would you give what what advice would you give to the younger generation who is potentially looking at getting involved but they're saying i i don't know if i would be good at being a counselor or a mayor because i see what the challenges that come with it yeah well you know one of the things and again i'm quite involved and have been for quite some time with youth i still have school groups come in here, uh, Chris, give them a little, as I call my 25 cent tour of what government does or doesn't do. And I've been doing that for years and I still get into schools as well, rather be high schools or public schools on telling them a little bit about government, what we do. And I've always said, I don't encourage people to get involved in politics, but I sure as heck don't discourage them either. I honestly don't. Said so you have to really think it out because uh, if you think about getting into it, be prepared to be criticized because you are as well intentioned as you want to be. That's going to happen if you're going to do your job and do it well. And that's when people really do have sober second thoughts about getting into the business. Because Chris, I've seen some great, great individuals become totally disillusioned with politics after a term or two. They said, no more for me, I'm out of here. And it happens frequently. But you know, you got to be a little thick skinned, because I guess I probably am uh, like you know, staying in as long as I have been. Have you enjoyed it? Have you enjoyed the ride that you've been on for the last 59 years? Yeah, I honestly have. Uh, you know, I often say, am I a little independent? Yeah, a little independent. I don't do much that I don't want to do. <laughs> and I've always been that way. So, you know. If I didn't like doing it, guess what? I wouldn't do it. Plain and simple. No magic to that. <laughs> Screw that. Um, now it's time for the final question. And it's yeah. the million dollar question because we started this interview talking about yourself, but we're ending talking about Milton. So I've yeah. got to ask, in your opinion, what does make Milton such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, everybody has to have a uh, tagline. We have a tagline here too. Melton is a place of possibilities. And I'm a firm believer in that. When somebody says, Gord, you can't do this or you can't do that. I say, just remove that letter T off of can't and you'll find you can. No magic to that. It's worked for me and will work for anybody else that's sincere is driven to make their life just a little bit better. Not only their life a little bit better, but everybody else's as well. Mayor, I want to thank you so much. This has been an absolute honor to sit down with you. You are our 700th guest on the show, and I could not have asked for a better guest to enjoy the first 700 episodes of this show. So let's hope the next 700 is as bet as good as the first 700. And I want to thank you for serving. And I, I, I truly mean that. I sincerely mean that, that I don't think municipal politicians hear that enough. You guys are the front lines. You have to make the big decisions. As the saying goes, the federal, has, the federal government has the money, the provincial government has the power, and the municipal municipalities have all the issues and you have been on the front lines of dealing with those issues mayor and, grants well and how true it is what, what i often say chris when the going gets tough the tough get going and uh, i fall into that category let me tell you and you you are a tough man for being able to handle it out for 59 years mayor Krantz. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for joining us today. It's a pleasure. And when I'm back in Milton in tw uh, this summer, I will certainly look you, uh, uh, Councillor Best and Councillor Cadill, uh, uh, up so that way we can all go grab a coffee. I'm not hard to find. You have a good one. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, thanks to the media on getting the messages out there is what democracy is all about. Thank you, Your Worship, for sitting down with us today and joining us for our 700th episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Now, for just some transparency's sake, when I originally launched this show in 2019, 
we, as I've said in past, we didn't really have a focus. We just wanted to have conversations with people. And in last year, in January of 2023, when we decided that we were going to go to a more municipal focus, I, I truly didn't know what to expect. I truly didn't know that people would want to sit down and listen to mayors, councillors, Reeves, directors from across Canada, listen to them talk about themselves and talk about their community. But I have found a following. And I, and I, I don't say that to boast my own uh, attitude here, but we have found uh, a niche in this world that I think needs to be talked about more. Municipal governance is the front line of politics. It is the government of proximity, as Scott Pierce, president of FCM, would say. And I, I, I truly believe that we are now in a world where we look at things through a 15 second lens and you tuning in every single week, week after week, day after day, and listening to municipal leaders talk on for longer than 15 seconds is kind of heartwarming. And, and when I originally launched this show back in 2019, I made a pledge that I would end after 700 episodes and I would just pick up and walk away depending on if it was successful or not. I didn't want to leave on a high note, but I didn't want to leave where I was just doing 700 episodes and no one was listening. But here we are, 700 episodes in, and I have made the decision to continue on. Now, this is hard. This is a lot of work. So if today's episode, if you have found any of our episodes interesting, hit that subscribe button, hit that follow button, because this first 700 was fantastic. The next 700 is going to be even better. And I say that with respect to all the guests that we've had on the show, but the next 700 episodes are going to be as fantastic or even better than the first 700. So stay in the loop with all our diverse content that we have covering municipal politics through our in-depth issue-focused show on the municipal affairs with Chris Brown to our in-depth conversations like you saw today with Mayor Krantz on the cross-border interviews or even our eye-opening exploration of local governance and the decisions that local governances make on the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we don't want to say we're your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, but we are. We're the ones that are trying to talk to the municipal leaders one-on-one, -on -one, whether it be a rural, small town, or large urban centers. We've got you covered, and we are hoping to engage with you on a regular, ongoing basis. Now, your support is the backbone of the growth of this program. When we originally started out, it was on a shoestring budget, but the people who have backed the show, who have made contributions, who have made monthly contributions, are continuing to help us to grow and bring you more exciting content over the years to come and weeks to come because we do have a very exciting summer and spring and fall of 2024. Now, if you can, consider backing the show because like I said, every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. You can find our support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. So for the 700th time, and until tomorrow, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, for the 700th time, continue talking.